Hello, and welcome back to Rewildology, the podcast that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. It has been so unbelievably cool that this tiny show has been around long enough to bring back former guests onto the show to share all of their awesome updates from the past year and a half. Yes, today we are sitting down with one of Rewildology's first guests, Daniela Shusid, PhD, to discuss some pretty big professional and personal updates that has happened since we last sat down. If you have time, I recommend going back into the archives and listening to episodes 14 and 15 called Turning Passion into Research, Elephants and Human Health before listening to today's episode. Or if you're like, Brooke, look, I'm already here and I don't feel like scrolling through 90 episodes, then keep listening because I don't blame you, my friends. As a quick recap, Daniela is an assistant professor at Indiana University in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health, and she's doing wicked cool research studying the links between trauma, mental health, and aging in African elephants, and how these effects help us understand our own physiology. Daniela shares several updates, including her promotion to assistant professor from postdoc researcher, how her studies in Zambia, Uganda, and the Congo are going for savanna and forest elephants, and one really big personal update that she and I weren't able to discuss in her first interview. I'm not going to spoil it here and let you hear the story straight from Daniela. But really quickly, before we dive into the episode, I have two announcements. First, I wanted to personally thank all of you that bought a piece of rhino and or rewildology swag during the rhino conservation campaign. Combined, we raised over $450 for conservation, which will be donated to the Katie Adamson Conservation Fund and to Rocky Mountain Wild as a sponsorship for the Picas Prairies and Climate Crisis Photography Exhibit in Boulder, Colorado. Additionally, we had some travelers book a safari to see the rhinos at Envelo in Zimbabwe. Seriously, I am so moved by your willingness to join a great cause and save our chubby unicorns. It helps that the shirts are really cool, I must admit. <laughs> Second, Rewildology's 100th episode is coming up, which is wild, and I want you to be a part of the show. Heather, the show's audio and video producer, is going to ask me your questions with a cocktail in hand, of course. If your question is selected, you'll get a shout out during the show and have that burning question in the back of your mind finally answered. You all know I'm an open book, so please don't hold back. Ask me whatever you'd like. Submit your questions by emailing at hello at rewildology.com or by DMing on one of the show's many social media accounts at Rewildology. The deadline is Wednesday, October 26th, so be sure to submit them before then. Okay. Enough of me talking. Let's get to today's episode with Daniela. Well, hi, Daniela. Thanks again for coming on the Rewildology podcast. I cannot believe it's been a year, actually over a year, yeah, since we sat down last time. And luckily, everything, you have so many updates to share with us, and I cannot wait to dive in. So, But before we get to like all the new stuff, everything you just accomplished, and all the other new stories we have to share... Just in case someone hasn't listened to your first interview, our first conversation together, could you just give a quick recap of who you are, what you do, and like your research, and then we'll move from there. Yeah, sure. No, they should go back to that episode and go check on, it yeah, out. Of course, I wish I knew 15. what episode number it was. Oh, there you go. 14 <laughs> yeah. to 15. Yeah. Yeah. So my name's Dr. Daniela Shuseed. I'm an assistant professor at Indiana University. I'm in the School of Public Health. And I have three ongoing projects that loosely fall under a very, very broad umbrella. That is how human activities impact elephant behavior and health. So in the Republic of Congo, I'm studying forest elephants and looking at associations between human density, uh, human elephant conflict and their physiology, mainly like stress response and, and things like that. In Uganda, I have ongoing work there. It's um, real cool in the sense that there's forest elephants, savanna elephants, and they can interbreed and have what we term hybrid elephants. And hybrid elephants can also have babies and conceive. And so an ongoing project there looking at a couple things because of 
increases in human population and natural landscapes being converted to humanized landscapes, we're seeing savanna elephants in the forest and vice versa. So the first question is, savanna elephants, which evolved to live in a savanna, how do they fare compared to forest elephants living in a, in a shared forest ecosystem? And then kind of because of COVID and having to be creative and flexible and all these things because stuff happens and you weren't expecting <laughs> it. Another line of query came about, which I think is super, super cool, super fascinating. I'm nerding out on it. I can't wait to see where it goes and what our results show. But adaptability of hybrids compared to the full species. And are these elephants that have obviously a different genetic makeup now because they have some forest elephant genes, they have some savanna elephant genes. How are they adapting to the same environment and the changing environment? Things like with climate change and rain patterns changing. So how are they fair compared to the full species? And are they more adaptable? And then what I'd say is my primary location in Zambia, it's a long-term project examining early life trauma. So really we're looking at elephants that became orphaned, particularly because of poaching, but not always necessarily the case. So how does experiencing this extreme stressor early in life during a sensitive developmental window, how does that impact their behavior? How does that impact their health and their pace of aging? So we're comparing those wild elephants to age and sex matched wild elephants that are all living in the same national park. And that's Kapui National Park. Yeah, I think that was the the quick and dirty. <laughs> yeah. Considering the last, yeah, our last conversation was like two hours long. That was very impressive. Yes, I just like put that like whole conversation in like two that's minutes. My elevator, my elevator pitch real fast. Very, very <laughs> impressive. Very impressive. Okay, so fantastic. Thanks for that quick recap. So now let's get to pretty much the calendar year of 2021 to beginning of this year. You were able to go okay. back into the field. You were able to go back yeah. out and work on your projects again. So what are the some what are some big updates that, you know, your work, but maybe what you've discovered, like stories, everything. What what's happened? Oh since man. Then? Who can remember <laughs> it all? Who can remember it all? Well, so from a I'd say academic standpoint, uh, so one of those big things is I became an assistant professor from a postdoc, I think, from the Congrats. last time I spoke. Yes, that's a new yeah, title. Uh, <laughs> yes. So I'm finishing year one as an assistant professor. So that's from like that, but that's not as fun as like the field stories. But I'm trying to remember when we spoke. That was before I went to to Zambia last summer. Right. Yeah. You hadn't, okay. you hadn't gone so back over right yet. Now. I think it's twice since we last spoke. Okay, and I'm getting, gearing up to go to go in a month again. Yeah. So the the big thing is getting this trauma study up and running. So it is funded through the National Institute of Aging. That's part of the NIH, National Institutes of Health. And I'm very proud of that. It's something that starting in my PhD, which I kind of thought was I. I it was something that I was doing an exercise because I was told to do it. And that was, why is someone in a department in nutrition sciences where predominantly everyone's studying human obesity? Why is there someone in this department studying elephants? And so I had to answer that question as a PhD student. And to be honest, I, I was just fudging it. Right? I, <laughs> didn't, I didn't think, okay, I'm going to end up being in a school of public health as faculty. I thought I'd go the ecology route, biology, something more traditional, right? And so I was just coming up with an answer. But over time, through, through my mentors and their network, they put me in positions to succeed, giving talks at the NIA, meeting folks that are connected in the aging world. I actually started realizing this connection uh, between that I thought was kind of being underutilized. And that is studying elephants, not just for the benefit of elephants, which is my passion and my number one, but hey, there's this bi-directional benefit, and that is we could study elephants to help improve human health and aging, particularly the health span and understanding more about the biology of aging. And at the beginning of my career, and when I was starting to study elephants, I got all this pushback and not a lot of love, let's say. Hmm. And so this has been a culmination of several years of me pushing on these walls, pushing these walls down, and to have... This project funded, it's a, a K01 mechanism, and it's a five-year grant that's from the NIA, was very gratifying and really kind of cemented, hey, all this work you're doing and, and a lot of 
people saying this is crazy or this doesn't make sense or why this, you know, why elephant, blah, blah, you know, is one of those that was just like, yeah, cool. I got it. I got it. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was really like just personally a big, a big moment for me. And I found out of that funding this Jan, this past January, officially it was awarded. So last year though, we started the project as a pilot project. And then this year I was there starting to expand it and run and get it running. So we're doing a lot of cool things. This past year, we collared six wild elephants and that allows me to follow them for the next few years, collect repeated samples from the same elephants. And now in October, I'll call her four more. We're doing cool things like these cognitive tasks where, and everything I'm talking about, it's not just orphan elephants, it's orphan elephants and wild elephants. We're putting up these cognitive boxes that these elephants have to figure out how to open up to get a natural occurring fruit in there, right? So trying to understand problem solving is problem solving different between these two populations. We're collecting tissue samples. We're obviously collecting a lot of poop because that is... <laughs> the heart of my research. So a lot of cool things happening there. And this is all in collaborations with Game Rangers International. And now I'm also serving as their special advisor for scientific research. I think that's the title. <laughs> and that was also really cool is building this that started off as like probably a cold email, if I remember correctly, to Game Rangers International a few years back. And then this relationship building and growing. And now the people I work with are fantastic and I love and it's it's been fantastic. So a lot of cool stuff happening in Zambia. I was just in Congo and I was a bit more nervous about it. First off, I don't speak French and I'm talking about Republic of Congo. And, and when you're in the forest, that's not an issue. But when you're around more people, that is an issue. And my first time there, Congo by far is the most challenging location I've worked in, both from a science point of view and a personal point of view. It's very isolated. And so you definitely have to think about things differently to have the research be successful. But also personally, that's very challenging. And like the food is not great <laughs> because, because you're so isolated, right? So everything is non-perishable. And that just means you're eating a lot of canned whatevers over and over in the same thing day after day after day. And so last, oh no, that wasn't last year. That was a couple of years ago when I was first there. It didn't go as smoothly as I wanted. It was one of my first times where I was leading everything in terms of a field project. And it doesn't matter if you have field, ex I mean, it does matter if you have field experience in some aspects of just, you know, comfortability and, and knowing certain things. But every country is different. Every field site is different. The ins and outs are different. The people you're working with, the culture, right? And so it does take time to to acclimate and understand. And it was a very steep learning curve. And I was definitely getting bumps and, and not always succeeding as I wanted to, I guess. And so this trip was a very much like redemption tour for me, where <laughs> okay. personally, I wanted to, to, to have a different experience. And I couldn't have imagined a better outcome for my time there and met a lot of new folks. So that project in collaboration with WCS, Wildlife Conservation Society. There's a lot of new folks there that I didn't know when I was doing the field work and meeting them. We did some capacity building workshops and it really, again, I think pushed my relationship with them forward. And now we have bigger goals collectively that we're trying to achieve. We just put in a grant a couple of weeks ago together. And so that also was just fantastic. Also reaffirmed I need to learn French. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so just kind of been bouncing, bouncing back and forth between here and in the field sites, wrapping up projects, starting new projects, and, you know, obviously having fun in between. Yeah, and didn't, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the last time we chatted, forest elephants weren't recognized oh, as their own species, they right? They were not. Since then, like actually like a month or something after we sat down, their status changed. Could you tell me a little bit about that and maybe what that has meant since? Yeah, so I believe it was the end of March, beginning of April, somewhere around there of last year, officially forest elephants were recognized as a distinct species of African elephants. Now we have our savanna elephants. And for those listening who may not be as familiar, 
those are probably the African elephant you're thinking of when you're thinking of an African elephant. Really big ears, big. They're living in East Africa and South Africa primarily. And they're, for a time, the forest elephant was considered a subspecies of them. The forest elephants are much smaller. Their ears are more rounded. They have straighter tusks. They're typically a bit more pink and brown in hue because of the minerals in their diet. They eat more fruit compared to our savanna elephant. And what's really important is then their population number. So best guess out there right now is somewhere around 50,000 compared to roughly 350,000 savanna elephants. So that really changes how the, the African elephant is being classified. So before it's threatened, now our savanna elephant is classified as endangered and our forest elephant is classified as critically endangered. So I think in that context, that brings really big changes. It also, what I'm hoping is brings more attention to the forest elephant. I don't think a lot of people know about the forest elephant. And this way, if you have more eyes on them and there's more pressure internationally, things like that, hopefully that also helps with their, their conservation. But yeah, super, super monumental. The challenge is now, how do we handle those hybrid elephants, right? Because full species are the ones that receive protection, not the hybrids. So what are we doing about that? And, and that's still a question mark, you know, still trying to figure it out. But these guys are genetically different, morphologically different, ecologically as well. So forest elephants aren't, they, they're not as gregarious. They don't have as big of like a social group. Their herd size is, is much smaller. Doesn't seem like they have like a quote unquote true matriarch like you'd see with the savanna elephants. But yeah, it's, yeah, that was, that was a big, big change. Yeah, yeah. I really want to take a second to chat about that because that was one of the biggest updates that I can think of since our last conversation, like a huge one that has yeah. massive implications, I'm sure, for your work and maybe even like funding opportunities or if someone well, listening. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yep. If someone listening is like, maybe they're really interested in elephants. It sounds like this could be another place in research that could maybe possibly use some help. But 100%. yeah. 100%. I thought that was awesome. I was like, wow, what are the odds that Danielle and I sit down? And then like the one big thing you were advocating for and really hoping would happen yeah. did come to fruition. So I definitely wanted to make sure we had the moment to talk about that because like that Thank is you. a massive update. If hopefully if someone listening hasn't heard our first conversation, they go back and they can hear that. Wow, that actually did change. Like that actually did progress forward because yes. sometimes yes. it takes forever for these things to happen. So it that is good. Forever. It did right. take forever, yes. but it just did take forever between our last chat <laughs> and then the decision. <laughs> exactly. exactly. But another yes. thing related, I feel like in that space in terms of all of that and academia and science and everything takes much longer than, than you wanted to or expected to. And, you know, it's just one of those things you have to deal with whether you want to or not. Right, right. So yeah. let's go back to Zambia. When we were yeah, chatting great. last and catching up, you told me some crazy stories about like these elephant coloring experiences like going out and coloring them like share some of these stories with people listening it sounded wild <laughs> yeah oh my goodness oh my goodness so I was really nervous I'm a, I'm a talker I, I'm chatty all the time I could talk anybody's ear off and we're doing like little videos and capturing every aspect right so we could put something together and this this and this and I was asked how are you feeling right now and I had zero words because I was so nervous so we were we collared actually on my birthday was day one so we could talk about that too because it was fantastic uh, yes, being on my well. birthday uh, but it was right at the end of the rainy season and the beginning of the dry season and the rains were kind of a little late still so we're having some rains here and there in April and in Zambia, where I work, there are some plains, but there's also like a lot of thickets. So it's not a rainforest, but it is wooded areas. And I was quite concerned that we were going to find elephants because it was still so green and lush. So I was nervous, right? Like a lot is riding on this. First off, it's expensive and it's such an ordeal. So we're we're working with a helicopter again because of the environment, also the elephants. So the elephants I work with in Kifui, they're not comfortable around a vehicle. So I'd say, oof, man, at least at least once, if not twice a week. And I feel like that's a very conservative number I'm giving you. 
we get mock charged by elephants in the vehicle when we're going out for research. They, yeah, that's scary. Yeah, they just, I mean, the history, it's, I mean, that's you, you kind of yeah. get used to it, which is a good and a bad thing. But you also, you know, you're reading the elephant, right? So it's not like we're totally green out there and we don't know what to expect and we don't know what the elephant is telling us. So, I mean, we're very, I think, appropriately safe in terms of how we handle it. But you kind of also have come to expect it in certain contexts. But anyway, for those reasons, we are darting elephants from a, from a helicopter. And when I say me, are we, I mean the principal vet of the Department of National Parks and Wildlife for Zambia. So he's the one doing the darting. And yeah, so day one, we have the helicopter, the helicopter. It's coming from South Africa. They're not in Zambia, right? And we go up and it's just, I mean, the feeling was unbelievable. I can't put it into words. And just also seeing the landscape from that perspective, you just, I mean, it's unreal. It's unreal. And the way it is for the, the project, because I want to match our orphans to wild orphans, I had a specific idea of where I wanted us to color these elephants and sex ratio of these elephants. I wanted five females and one sub-adult male. And it is, it's a bit different to, to identify the sex of an elephant from above <laughs> than it is <laughs> when you're on the ground. And so I was, I was a bit nervous because again, my first time and, and didn't want to misidentify. So it's my call. I say, this is the elephant that we're darting. We communicate, right? And then Tristan, who is our pilot and Dr. Innocent, the vet, then they know what it is. Tristan maneuvers the helicopter in such a way that sets up Dr. Innocent for success with darting the elephant. And I do just want to take a brief pause and say the elephant's welfare is always first and foremost in these situations, right? We do not go after elephants that have young calves. We don't want to put those babies in bad situations where they could get lost from mom or something might happen to them. So we're going after very specific individuals. And anytime we think that it might be risky, we pull up and, and we're out of there. And in fact, we, we did do that a couple of times. We're just like, this isn't, this isn't a great situation. So they communicate and then Innocent is, is darting the elephant from the helicopter. We're monitoring the elephant from above. And then once we see the elephant is down, we go out there and you have to make sure the elephant is in a right position. So that's laying on her side, right? And she's able to breathe and we open up her trunk. We're monitoring her, her stats, like her heart rate, her breathing, right? And then the team is at it. And I think the fastest we did, which I was very proud of, was about 12 and a half minutes. We put a GPS collar on the elephant and we took every biological sample that we wanted. And that was blood, uh, kind of like a snot sample for lack of a better term, <laughs> tissue. So tissue sample, ticks, body measurements, and, uh, and dung. I think that might be every, oh, and a tail hair, right? So we have a great team. The team is myself and folks with Game Rangers International. We had someone from Elephant Connection that was helping us with capacity building and learning about collaring the elephants. And obviously we did some things before we went out. Um, but it was just awesome teamwork and just that whole situation. And for me, it was one of those things like on my, I don't want to say bucket list, but something professionally that I always wanted to, to reach. Like there's a few things. The other one's like a field vehicle and I have a field vehicle now. Her, <laughs> her name is M. Cyrus after Miley Cyrus because she's a badass, just like Miley Cyrus is. Like the vehicle's a badass, so is Miley Cyrus. Uh, so those two things happened this year, which were, yeah, something for me that I was always trying to, or for whatever reasons, probably like as like younger Daniela looking at other field biologists and researchers and what they're doing and and to me, that seemed like, yeah, that's, that's like a, like a little feather in your cap. It's like, it's like a, okay. like a next career level, like an accomplishment. It's like, yes, yeah, like, yeah. I'm so legit that I now have my own <laughs> yeah. in the M Cyrus yeah. car, like Miley Cyrus. I'm going to be riding with her every single day. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's pretty. She's a beautiful, beautiful vehicle. Ah, oh, she's great. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of like a brief overview of it, of the situation and, and, it was just so cool. So, so cool. 
And so then I guess, so then what's the next phase of this project then? So we have it funded. We've officially started collaring elephants. We have our, our field, our wild population, and then we have our captive population and we're doing different studies with them. So, and I know you said that it's going to be funded for five years. Do you think it'll be done in five years or what's the next phase of this? How do you start, yeah. you know, the de data collection stuff? Like, I guess what's right. phase two or three or four or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. So the yeah so there's funding but it's it's funding for five years but it actually doesn't fund the entirety of everything we're doing you know field work is, is expensive and so that there's continuing grant writing for it to continue it the goal is long term not just five years but that we're continuing it out right we don't want just a snapshot of what's going on with these elephants i want to know intimately how environment is relating to them on the long-term seasonal impacts, how they are progressing past this trauma, this stressor that they experience. How does it impact social networks? How does then their social networks also impact back on them, right? So there's so many really cool questions. I was having lunch today with a colleague of mine. And we we're even just talking about like how stress reduces the complexity of your behaviors and trying to untangle some of those uh, using this type of population. And, and so there's so much potential and I, I love the project. I love the people I work with. It's, I think, really set up for success. So we have started data collection. So immediately after we got those collars on, we started to track the wild elephants. We needed to figure out exactly who's in the herd. What are the herd compositions of the elephants we've collared? what and creating a database for them so we want to be able to identify those elephants right so it's really important that i know when we collect this dung sample it's coming from this specific elephant and it's a female and she is 10 years old and now this is her elephant id it's, it's her name and so each herd has a different category that their names are kind of falling under but basically getting laying the foundation to make sure that Repeated samples from the same individual is going to be possible over the long term. We want to get these elephants familiar with our vehicle. So M. Cyrus, she has fabric on her mirrors that smell like lavender. So every day, lavender, like essential oil is put on there so that these elephants start associating this smell with our vehicle and realize, hey, we're not hurting you. There's no poaching happening here. There's no hunting happening here. It's all good. So they don't charge us, they don't run away, and we're able to collect our data. So we've got that going on. We're having them exposed to these problem-solving games. We need to do some tissue collection with some biopsy darting. That will happen in October. So we're really starting to build for each individual a database of different biological samples that is going to give us a big picture of what's going on with that elephant, both internally and what we can see their behaviors and, and their size and, and all of that how they're interacting yeah so I'm so curious so it makes sense for the orphan and the captive elephants to do these like cognitive figuring out experiments how do you do that with wild elephants how do you present it to them and like see oh, yeah. like what's that yeah. <laughs> okay yes Just no um quite right. so <laughs> I have a collaborator in the project Josh Plotnick and he has used this game with Asian so he does primarily work with Asian elephants in Thailand and so I reached out to him. I said, hey, this is my idea. You think this would, this is going to work? And I always say, yes. Yes, it's going to work as well. Uh, nothing ever works as it's planned, though. So you got to right. be, <laughs> be persistent. You got to come up with some cool strategies to, to circumvent these smart animals uh, and big and strong. So, But he does it with adults. So these, these boxes, you're, we're not just welding them. Like a, a specific company is printing them with machines and this and that to make sure that they're elephant proof but a little bit more sturdy than if you were just to weld it yourself and they're attached to a tree and so for him with wild elephants that are adults it's no issue because you put it up high enough they can't step on it and it's on there tight enough they can't rip it off with their trunk like they can't get their trunk in there but i'm interested in sub adults and juveniles and infants which means that these boxes have to be height accessible to some of these smaller elements mm -hmm. so we haven't started it yet and so we'll start in October when I'm there. But the idea is that we're having two stations set up and each station has two boxes, one box that's higher up, one box that is lower. 
each station has camera traps set up on, on top and from the sides because we also don't want to be there to influence any behaviors, right? And so uh, we have already scouted some locations we want to put them in and we're hitting known elephant highways. It's like, we know these elephants come through here. They're going to pass them, pass it by. So put them up, put up the camera traps, wait for the elephants to find out that they're there. <laughs> and then hope, really hope, that the adults are letting the sub-adults and the juveniles and the infants interact with the boxes that are lower to the ground and that nobody's going to step on the lower boxes. Those are all my hopes and dreams. I'll let <laughs> you know a lot of hope. let you know how it goes, though. <laughs> that is a lot of hoping. <laughs> and a lot of hoping and a lot of dreaming. I already know it's not going oh, to work as I just described it to you. So we'll see how it goes and then we'll workshop it and and hopefully we'll get some of it to work. The downside of that part is it. we'll try to put it in because with the GPS collars, we see where these elephants are, right? So we'll try to put it in places where we know certain herds are and hope that our herd of interest will be going through. But the truth of it is, is it's likely not going to be them. And so it's just going to be different analyses, statistical analyses that we'll do. It, it won't be, this is tied to this elephant and we know they're stress levels, we know their parasite load, we know their dietary stress, like all that type of stuff. It won't be linked necessarily back to that. But you know, that's what happens when when you work in, in the field. <laughs> you gotta you gotta be more flexible. Right. Yeah, you yeah. pretty much just answered all of my questions because those is like the last little things and and having worked with elephants and being in Africa and oh. seeing wild elephants. I'm just like, how you going to do that but that's yes. not I mean that's, that's a really good experiment design no matter what with those camera traps there you're going to capture something cool and interesting. we'll capture something we'll capture something something's and, going and, to and, happen exactly <laughs> it might not be the question I was originally told was it, right. that's also the beauty of science it can give me something new that I wasn't expecting right and then there's a whole new line of, of research so you know you just we just see what we get <laughs> yeah <laughs> Exactly. And of course, then we'll have to do another podcast. It could be like, okay, so you all know that story that I told you about. That's right. I'll show you some videos. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. This would be fantastic. Oh, we had some actual yeah. videos too. Hopefully we had good videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully uh, elephants show up and, yeah. and they show up and show out for those videos. Oh, that would be fantastic and just so fun to share <laughs> yeah. too in so many different platforms. Oh my God, that'd be amazing. Oh, well, great. Awesome. Oh, they, they... So slight tangent. Wait, go can ahead. I go on a tangent real quick? Of I don't know if it's going gross or not. Okay. So I was just down in Orlando and I was giving a presentation to the Orlando Pride players. And in it, I was showing them about the coloring and we have, you know, all this GoPro footage and I was showing them different samples we collect. And, you know, to collect a dunk sample when the elephant is knocked down, right? You're getting personal with the elephant <laughs> and you have to do it rectally. And so you are just talking about videos. I shared this video and I was like, oh man, this is, this is going to be fantastic. And oh, the reaction, the reaction right. I got I was like, oh, oh man, is that your hand? Is that your hand? And then I said, and who wants the shitty job? And nobody, nobody thought that my pun, which I really appreciated. But nobody put their hand up. Nobody wanted to do it. I was like, seriously, not one person? It's not that. I mean, okay, like you're wearing a glove and stuff. But anyway, it made me think of sharing videos and then the responses you get from people who might not necessarily be a conservationist or a biologist or like, an outdoorsy person. The reactions really, really veer from your expectations, I guess, or at least my expectations. I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And everyone's like, oh, that's gross. <laughs> yes, like you're literally. Hey, wait, my friend was funny. Oh, that is so funny. Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm Tell laughing hysterically. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that was, I love tangents so. like that. You can share those at any time. <laughs> I'll show you. I'll show you the video later. <laughs> okay, on, there's on. multiple. <laughs> yeah. Oh, awesome! Well, another big update happened that you were able to share with me last time, and it was it's this is really really big, and you were actually able to come out to your African team that you know. Oh you yeah. Are. Yes, yes, which yes. is super just I can only imagine the weight that had to have come off your shoulders to finally be able to be open with the people you're closest with 
in Africa. So could you share with us how that happened and and maybe what that was like for you and just, yeah, the whole story, please, please tell us. Yeah. And I guess I'll give like a little back story because in that first, our first chat, you asked me, I think you asked me why I went to Israel or something like that. And I, I don't remember what my response exactly was, but it was something along the lines of, oh, like a friend or I don't know, but it was my, my college girlfriend. And I have been very out for probably close to 20 years now. And it felt very inauthentic when I said that to you. It's because, you know, the places I'm working in, it's illegal to be gay still. And I was concerned about potential repercussions and, and what that might be and, and things like that. But so we talked about it after, after we, you know, when you press record off, we, we yeah. talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it was, it was so strange, especially because I, it's, you know, my day to day, I'm, I don't even think about it because I don't have to. And I'm very out with everybody and anybody, even if you're a stranger, there's no hesitation in, in using she pronouns about a partner or, or someone I'm dating or something. But when I'm in, in the field, you know, Pinealese or Ugandan or Zambian, yeah, I, I am very much closeted and it's very uncomfortable for me. And I have to say, though, this experience made me really feel for potential Zambian colleagues who may be gay or Ugandan colleagues who may be gay or Congolese colleagues who may be gay. Because for me, it's just, you know, kind of temporary, but also I get a little bit more leeway, you know, not being Zambian or Congolese or Ugandan versus what they would get if they were to display any type of affection to a same sex individual. But really it came about because I got tired of always paying attention to the pronouns I was using and switching them. And also for me internally, I was just like, oh, gross, using the he pronoun, talking about someone like, <laughs> I mean, dating no offense to dudes or anything. It just was so unnatural for me that, yeah, I, I just got tired of it. And so this last year, maybe June or something, and one of my colleagues, Vincent, who's a research assistant with Game Rangers International, we were out looking for elephants and we were at the airstrip because it's really nice because it's really open so you can see the elephants much more clearly so we're sitting there and we're waiting for the elephants to come by the way they never came that day <laughs> of but that gave us uh yeah that gave us time to to chat and we just started talking about real life decisions and implications of certain decisions professionally personally blah blah and i was just like screw it. And I talked about, you know, women and blah, blah, and it was all good and well. And then maybe a couple of days later, I was with another one of my colleagues, Connie, who's a research assistant for Game Rangers. And we were talking about something. And I said pretty much a very similar thing to her. And her response was slightly different. I mean, nothing bad on her side. She was, you know, gosh, I hope they don't mind. I just called out, called them out with their responses. <laughs> she was, she was just like, not a problem for me, but you know, you just need to be aware of who, who you do say it to. Mm. And so then after that, like the core folks of who I was working with on a day to day, it just kind of ended up happening. We we're out and it was me, Vincent and, and, and Webster. And we we're talking about girls, or whatever. And, and then I was talking about a girl I was dating who was a, a mechanic, an airline mechanic, engine mechanic for a major airline. And so I was just like, I just used the she pronoun and I hadn't told Webster yet that I was gay, but Webster didn't blink an eye. So I was like, oh, all right, wait, wait, talk to me. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And so I just assumed like, you know, like I was in Lusaka and somewhere else, like we were at dinner and she's like, oh yeah, I know. And I was like, cool. And then she was like telling me about different things in the scene and like for them, them being Zambians, you know, like they call it like they're hiding. So I just kind of assumed everyone knew, but I was a little bit wrong actually this, this go around. <laughs> so then this time when I was back, because I assumed everybody already knew, I just was talking to everybody as if they did already know. And so like this woman who I didn't know last year, and we're talking and I'm just using the she pronouns. And I mean, she didn't bat an eye and I honestly don't know if she knew or didn't know, but that's just how it was. And then one of the drivers, we're in downtown Musafa and awful traffic. And these two guys came and hit the hood of the car. And I was like, oh, I think I try to tell you something. They rolled down the window. And then Yanja, one of their local languages, they had a little brief interaction and window goes up and he's like, oh, he told me to tell you that you should marry him. And I started laughing. 
he was like, wait, but you don't like guys, right? I was like, no, no. <laughs> he's like, and he uses the word affairs. He's like, so you only have affairs with women. And I said, yes. And I have to say, he's probably the one that has asked me most of the personal questions about it. And I think that's for the most part. And, and maybe like, you know, from a cultural and trying to be polite and not pry. But he was just asking, you know, trying to understand and, and I appreciate it. It, it made me laugh inside. I obviously didn't laugh outside because it was a very genuine, sweet moment. And I didn't want to make him feel badly. But, you know, like he asked me, oh, is it because you're always working around guys? You only work with guys. Is that why you like girls? I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I was like, I think I didn't like women way longer than starting to work out here with just guys. Like, <laughs> no, 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 no. And so it... It was then one of these things where we had conversations. I've talked to Webster and Webster actually said he didn't know when we were in the truck and I had that story. He just already assumed that I was. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you know, in, in my conversations with different Zambian colleagues, I do get different perceptions on being gay in Zambia. So, you know, for some, they think the tide is turning and people are are like, yeah, this this dude's gay or this, you know, whatever. And, and it's not that big of a deal. And then others are like, definitely no, don't, you can't do anything in public and you have to be, you know, closeted about it. And so there's, there's a bit of different perceptions from the people I've talked to about it all. I'm not out with, with my other colleagues in, in Congo or in Uganda in that context, but I spend most of my time in Zambia. And yeah, these people have become family to me and I and I think if we're going to be in order to be that close and to have that type of relationship you have to be genuine and authentic and now me and the guys like we're out looking for the elephants and stuff we have so many fun conversations (laughs) because now it's just like like I'm just like one of the dudes so we talk about all these things we talk about tinder there we talk about I mean (laughs) you name that topic and we're probably covering it and they just kind of like see me as a dude like one of the guys it was like, you know, you talk like a guy and you act like a guy. <laughs> I think by allowing them into that side of me, and I have to say everyone has been so lovely and, and great with it. And, and they're all, yeah, I mean, they, I don't want to say they don't care, but yeah, it's just like, it's just, it is what it is. And just the thing is, you know, you have to be aware of where you are, right? So these are folks that know me that are exposed to different types of perceptions, ideas, cultures, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And I equate it to even in the U.S., like in the U.S., if you're in Miami, you're in New York or whatever in a big city, OK, it's no one's going to like bat their eye. But if you're in rural Indiana, which is kind of where I, I live, in, maybe it's not that easy for someone and I think it's kind of similar in that context if you're hit in the rural spots where there's not a lot of connections to the other parts of the country or even the world specifically the response might be very different than than what I got but it was fantastic I am so happy and like I said like the people I work with are are just amazing so it was, it was great. I, I don't know if I'm where that is going to be like in terms of Uganda or, or, mm-hmm. or Congo or something, but yeah, with all the folks like in Zambia, I mean, I think for me, I, I, I still assume everybody knows <laughs> whether that is true. I don't know, but my assumption is everybody knows. Yeah. Were you scared to tell that person in the car? Oh, yeah. First? I felt yeah. like I was a 16 year old. I got <laughs> like, I was back as like a little kid and saying these sentences that were so hard to form because I haven't had to say them in like 20 years like oh I'm gay oh I like girls oh my goodness I haven't had to say anything like that in so long right like first off I feel like in the states I'm a walking billboard for for being gay so I feel like I don't even have to say it (laughs) but it's also conversations I haven't had in such a long time that are like they're just not natural because I'm not having it regularly or right. or recently yeah yeah so it was it was I was nervous for sure and I mean with the guy in the car I had already known him for a little while I wasn't expecting something you know an adverse response or something really bad but the first couple times I came out like Vincent and, and Connie yeah I was very nervous I'm sure the way I said it was all choppy and <laughs> funny and whatnot but yeah for sure mm. 
But that's just such a great story, I think, in general. And just it just I think it just shows so many layers that one, even though on this platform, we try to be as open and as, as authentic as possible, we still could not share one of the most important things about you, you yeah. know, just because we just we couldn't do that because we couldn't we could not jeopardize your relationship with your you know, African colleagues. And and that just. I just, I don't know, that that felt so shitty that we just like couldn't talk about this because it is such an important part of who you are. I mean, it is who you are. And so to know when you told me that, you're like, guess what? I was able to come out. And <laughs> yeah. like, I, felt, I felt relieved. I'm like, oh my gosh, finally, she can be who she is yeah. around these people that you spend a lot of time with, you know, like, just like yeah. you said, I mean, hours upon hours with these people. Yeah. And now they can finally know th who Daniela truly is. You don't have to hide anymore. So I'm sure you, it must feel amazing. Yeah, it was, it, I mean, it was fantastic. And I just, I, I mean, I felt fake before, mm -hmm. you know, and like disingenuous with these stories and like, ugh, also talking as if I'm talking about a boy right now like it just set, felt so <laughs> off there but also I do think it, it puts up a barrier between you and another person in in your relationship right and so that in and of itself even if they right they don't know but I know and so right whether I'm consciously doing it or not it does impede some intimacy that you're having and one of the things I love the most about my field work is well, first off, you, I meet so many incredible people. I mean, I can't tell you how many different folks I'm meeting from different countries, different backgrounds, different cultures, and then when you get to learn from them, right? It's just truly remarkable. And it's just such a privilege to be able to have that, those experiences. And in that context, because you're in these environments where, you know, you're, you're a bit more remote, you also have this shared interest in some capacity that revolves around that whether that's conservation whether that's elephants whether that is nature whatever right like what brings you there and brings another person there you have some commonality there as well and being in this type of setting and with similar like I guess your people in, in that way right your relationships I feel like are so much deeper so much more intense so much faster all that versus me knowing someone for a month in Bloomington versus me knowing someone for a month at one of my field sites are two completely different things. And the speed at which you become very close with somebody is exponential there. And so this really, I mean, gosh, like even this last trip we talked about, we just talked about how everything had just like rocketed. It was amazing and it's been fantastic. And I'm really grateful that, you know, the people I work with are who they are and that I get the opportunity to to do this with them. Yeah. Yeah. And to, to continue down this path, I felt it last time and I definitely feel it now that there's like a different air about you that since the last time we sat down, almost like almost like a different level of confidence or like a new level in your career. And yeah. when we were chatting last, you said that you've like grown as like a conservation leader, essentially. Do you mind elaborating a little bit on that? And Oh, like yeah, that? no, not at all. Yeah, so I felt it myself this time. So in the past, I felt very micromanagey. I had to do everything. I wanted to do everything. I needed to be the one collecting the dunk sample. I needed to be doing A, B, and C. And, and sorry, that's Bennett. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and in some aspects, I think that is natural for where I was in my stage of my career. So some of it is making sure that I'm comfortable with what I'm doing. I know how to do everything. I am proficient in it. But also, I really had to learn how to be a better mentor, which is something I'm still working on, and how to be a better leader, which is also something that I'm still working on. And so for some people, they're natural born leaders. I don't think that's me necessarily. I am very determined. I am very competitive. I am ambitious and all of those things drive me for sure. But, but I'm the, the youngest sibling and I have a, an amazing sister who I look up to. Oh my goodness. And she is a fantastic older sister in the context of even to today, she will like take care of things for me. And she also did that when we were kids, right? And I think in some context, because of those experiences, she is a natural born leader versus I'm like, oh, she's got it. She's handling it. 
I don't have to speak up. She's got it, right? And so for me, there was a lot of having to learn what type of leader I was, what that looked like, how to communicate, how to communicate in, in societies that are still, for the most part, patriarchal, right? And so as a woman, you, not, I don't want to paint a, a broad brush and that everyone's like this, because that's not the, that's not the situation by any means. But you do have more instances where you have men you're working with that are maybe less ready to listen or follow or ask you because you are a woman, right? And so trying to figure out how to to navigate that. And so like this time around, I mean, in so many ways, like I, I saw, I didn't have to do everything. Like I want my guys doing it. I want to empower them. I want to build their skills. I want to help them reach their professional professional goals right versus before I felt like it was a lot more me 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 Mm. and now I am more confident in myself I am more confident in a scientist and more confident in being able to do field research and you know there's very much imposter syndrome and I'm I definitely have imposter syndrome you know at times and and some of that comes from the fact that oh well I don't live in any of these countries I'm working in, right? I'm living here. And so I'm not exposed to all these things as often as other people are. And so that part kind of creeps in. And so having now so much field experience in so many different countries and under different circumstances and seeing, shit, yeah, I did that. Oh man, I had this experience. I was able to handle it. Oh, I learned how to rewire solar panels to batteries and, and shit like things I've never do I, I wouldn't know awesome like like even the behaviors around wild animals ha- like I can't I mean I've had so many crazy stories with with different species and having to run here or hiding here or whatever like waking up from a nap with that boo stealing my bananas right like <laughs> just all those little things yeah it's crazy I yelled at them and chased them out though because they ate my chapatis and they ate my bananas, two of my favorite food items. <laughs> so, but they're, you know, experience is really important. And I think because of my non-traditional background, I have been a little bit of a chip on my shoulder of, am I as good as, can I do this the same, right? Because like for my PhDs, it was mainly with, with zoo populations. I did not have, my primary mentor was not a field biologist. My elephant mentor does most of her work in Thailand with semi-captive elephants or with zoo populations. Again, so I didn't have a lot of those experiences early on. I had very minimal, I had like three weeks here type of a thing, right? I didn't get that opportunity and I didn't have someone showing me the way during my quote unquote developmental years in science (laughs) right and so I think that kind of stayed in the back of my mind a bit and so figuring it out and and realizing oh yeah you you got this and oh yeah you don't have to do everything you need to make sure though that the trains are arriving on time right you need to make sure the trains have the right parts on them right making sure that that's happening and letting others do you know data collection I need to make sure that I train them properly to do that because they're the ones doing it more than me. I'm there for a few months out of the year. They're there all the time. And yeah, and then how, if I have a a disagreement or I feel like things aren't being done how I want them to be done or my voice isn't necessarily being heard as it should be, how do I address that? And, you know, that's that's something I'm still working on. You know, a lot for me is, I didn't always have the right response in the moment and I have to think about it. And then I come back and this person probably has no idea what I'm about to tell them because like for them, it has already passed. But like two hours later, I'm like, hey, listen, you remember when this happened? Well, all right, this is what should have happened. And, and, you know, and kind of go through it. So for sure, it's been a transformative period and I, I could feel it in myself and I could see it in my in my actions and, you know, hoping that obviously I, I'm still developing and, and and trying to get better and better. But I do think it's important to hear for young people or people interested in, in field work or at the beginning, it's okay not to know. It's okay to, to feel unsure, right? And everyone has been there. And like I said before, like Congo was so rough at the beginning. And 
it was awesome because the woman I started working with in Congo, she now works for an NGO in Zambia. So this past time I went over, she's in a, a different national park on the other side. So I was over there and we met up and, and we had a conversation about this. And she's like, I'm so glad to hear how positive things are going with you in Congo and this collaboration that I'm doing there and with CAR and just expanding it. She's like, that was the vision I had. And she knew how rough it was for me at mm -hmm. the beginning. And, you know, people are championing for you, even if you know it or, if, you know, or if you don't know it, but you just gotta, I mean, you're going to make mistakes. Just don't keep making those same mistakes over and over. Like, that's what I tell like my team, like honesty is so important. Like data quality, right? If you're not honest about, are you confident that this elephant is 15 years old? Yes or no. And if you're not, don't write that they're 15. Is this elephant a male or female? If you're not confident it's a male, don't write it's a male. You can make notes in the notebook, say, this is what you think. This is why this, this is why that. And then, and then that's why we have video. We video everything. We can go back, we can look, we can talk about it, but you have to be honest. And if you make a mistake, you have to own up to it. And that's cool because you're going to learn from it and we're just not going to do it again, right? And so I think that's important for, for students to hear because no, nobody's perfect and no one expects you to know what you're doing from, from the jump, right? So it's a process. Yeah, I think that's pretty applicable to everybody. <laughs> I know that you're wrapped in your new assistant professor, professorship, professor, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. That was yeah, you got it. You got a mouthful. It. Wow. Oh, I'm sure I messed up a whole bunch of words already. Don't worry. No. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I felt exactly the same way starting, you know, this whole platform and just any any new endeavor that we get in, like you will figure it out. Just keep like, mm -hmm. just like you said, just don't make the same mistakes. It's OK if you make it the first time, especially if you own yeah. up to it. And if you have to apologize, that's that's fine. People are OK with that. It's it's yeah, we all have our journeys to come on. But I I really wanted to take a second to you're different in a very good way. Not that was anything before Thank was you. bad. No, I know. No, no, no. <laughs> but I, I can tell, I can see how much you've grown in just this short amount of time since the last time we sat down and, and and calling that out and like, what have you learned? What have you experienced? And that is great advice for anyone listening about wherever they are in their career or whatever they're doing. It doesn't matter what you're doing right now. But yeah, so Thank if anybody you, yeah. does want to possibly maybe even connect with you, maybe chat, maybe they oh, might absolutely. that they might want to discuss with you or a similar story or just watch. I mean, your your videos crack me up. Like when you're like collecting dung in the field, I was laughing hysterically <laughs> when I see you on Instagram <laughs> pop up. I'm like, oh, what is Daniela doing now? Yes. But yeah, yeah. please like shout out. How can people connect with you? Everything. Yeah, so I mainly operate on Instagram, though I have it feed to my Twitter account and Facebook. And on Instagram, my handle is the underscore elephantologist. Um, I'm trying to really make that a word. People who study elephants are primatologists. I study elephants. Ergo, I'm an elephantologist. So yeah, the underscore elephantologist. I'm also, you can email me and my last name is a little tricky. So I'd say... Probably you can just go to IU, Indiana University School of Public Health. I'm an environmental occupational health. You can find my email there, but it's my first initial last name, DCC at IU.edu. Happy to, you know, to talk to, you know, to anyone because really, right, like that is, I mean, I love what I do. I, I feel like I'm so lucky that I get to have these experiences. I get paid to learn. I get paid to think. I get paid to be creative. And then I get paid to to have how many weeks and how many months in Congo or in Uganda or in Zambia. And I get to see elephants and I get to see lions and I get to see wild dogs. Oh, I love wild dogs, by the oh way. Oh my God, me too. Birthday, but I saw them on my birthday and it was fantastic. It was, <laughs> oh my goodness. Having these experiences, right? I'm really lucky. And one of the other really cool aspects of my job is mentoring. And it's very important that we provide the skills and the confidence to the next group and the next generation of conservationists and scientists. And so I, I absolutely always respond to, to everybody. And sometimes it may take me a few days via email, but I don't think I have not responded to somebody. And so happy to, to talk to anyone at any stage on any range of questions that they may have. You know, I'm, my thoughts, my opinions, Obviously, can't speak 
on behalf of Indiana University. Um, <laughs> <Me too. laughs> sorry, I feel like that's a disclaimer I had to throw in there at some point. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to talk about my experiences and my opinions and, and my thoughts and stuff. <laughs> Perfect. And I'm sure that if somebody just to hear that, that you are open to chat with them, that's so wonderful. But again, Daniela, thank you for taking time out of your crazy busy schedule in between the field and everything else to come back on the podcast and, and share these wonderful updates. I'm sure everybody will love to hear it. Oh, man, it's so much fun. I absolutely love chatting with you, Brooke. So anytime. It's fantastic. Oh, I absolutely adore Daniela. She is so much fun to talk to, and I hope to one day share a gin and tonic with her over a campfire in Africa. And you all are always welcome to join me. <laughs> if you have a specific question you'd like to discuss about today's topic, head on over to the Rewildology YouTube channel and submit your question in the comment section of today's. Some of you have reached out and asked how you can support the show. Well, I'm happy to share that there are several ways to do so. Some zero-cost ways to support the show include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the Rewildology newsletter at the website, subscribing to the Rewildology YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves, consider making a monetary donation at rewildology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love. At least 10% of proceeds from this podcast will be donated to our conservation partners. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Heather Valley, the show's audio and video producer, for making the show sound and look awesome and focus right for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the focus right gear we use to record the show, head on over to rewildology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>